As I said, the moth is being described, and I will just read these. And she writes, I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid of all the years leading up to it. Still, I'll be thinking of this moth all week and the weeks after, remembering how I wanted to kneel before this ancient furred body, to slip it into my mouth, savoring the heat of whatever last light might have killed it. And it's those seven lines, what, what struck me about these lines is that you have this description that leads to these lines, I'm not afraid of death, I'm afraid of all the years leading up to it, where we have this moment where it seems as if the speaker is identifying with the moth. And then in just five lines later, we have a kind of complete reversal where the speaker puts the moth in her mouth, right? And, and begins to savor, as she says, the heat of whatever last life might have killed it, which I understand to be the storm, right? The storm has killed it. So she moves from identifying with the moth to seven lines later, identifying with the storm, uh, identifying with what has been killed, and moving to identifying with what has killed it. And that little deft, nuanced shift really struck me, and I, I, you know, I had that experience of the way you kind of wake up a little bit more when you read these great moments and poems. And I think it's that kind of a moment that continues to define her work in all of the, the books of hers that I've read. And I think that, as well as this sort of embrace of some of the most complex and contradictory human impulses. And uh, as someone who is uh, continue to follow her work, I have to say that I continue to be inspired by um, the range of material and subject matter that she draws from. She draws from history and science and uh, popular culture, and you, you can move from one book where there's a beautiful long poem about Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, to another book with another beautiful long poem about the invention of the kaleidoscope, to her most recent collection, where you have a wonderful series of persona poems from the points of view of uh, iconic golden era film stars, Mae West and W.C. Fields. And so it's, it's that kind of range and intelligence and ambition that over the years has brought me back to her work over and over again. And of course, I am not the only one to have noticed these things. Um, I can say, just to read you a few of the awards that she's received, she's the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Amy Lowell Poetry Traveling Fellowship, an NEA Fellowship, multiple Pushcart Prizes, the 2016 AWP Nonfiction Prize, and more. And of her, the poet Major Jackson has said, she refreshes and renews debates about beauty, suffering, and art for the 21st century. And as the poet Tom Slay adds, no one sounds like she does. And her concern about the post in post-confessional is as much a sign of her earnest desire to honor every aspect of her art as it is an anxiety that spurs her restless investigations of family, selfhood, racial identity, and erotic life. So in other, words, in other words, she is the real deal. <laughs> and uh, it is my great honor to get the chance to introduce her tonight. So I hope that you will join me in welcoming our reader, Paisley Rippon. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was terrifying. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, that introduction, which is very generous and beautiful, and now I'm just going to drink half of this right now. <laughs> my high school class is here. Uh, <laughs> not lying, like several of my friends from high school. Uh, we made our way out of Seattle, only to get as far as San Francisco, it seems. Um, but uh, it's so great to see you guys, and it's great um, to be invited here uh, and to speak with all of you and. There's some good news and bad news. The good news is I'm reading three poems. The bad news is one of them is long. Um, they all kind of go together, so I'm going to basically give my pattern now and uh, read them sort of straight through. I've been working on uh, a book that basically rewrites many of the myths from Ovid's Metamorphoses and responds to the Metamorphoses. And um, I don't do a one-for-one. 
uh, reenactment of the myths because I'm not interested in that because I think that makes it seem kind of glib and silly. Um, so I'm really interested in the idea of what it means to change. I'm interested in the very contradictory ways that Ovid would feature and think about change. I'm interested in the ways that he thought about violence and representation and um, speech. And so the first poem, uh, it doesn't really matter too much if you know the stories that I'm referencing because in some of this, the poems, I'll actually describe the poems that I'm, I'm talking about originally um, or explain them. But I guess that's all I'll say. The second piece that I'll be reading will be drawing from a number of different kind of outside sources. I won't quote those outside sources, I won't cite them, but um, trust me that they are actually cited at some point. Philabella. Because her grandmother loved the arts, her father said, she'd willed the money to a distant cousin working as a sculptor. A decision made the month before she died from cancer, which the young woman cannot now believe was due only to a brain tumor, having endured the last deliberate ways her grandmother asked why she'd never married. The cousin, who inherited the money, showed her sculptures in a converted barn the only space large enough to contain the seething shapes that seemed to flame up from their pedestals in precarious arcs. An audacity of engineering the young woman tried not to see as a reproach when, curious, she visited. How the sculptures made her feel too earthbound, solid. At the gallery, she stared a long while at what she thought was a tree blasted by lightning. But the more she looked, the more clearly shapes emerged. There were a man's hands gripping a slender figure by the waist, the thin body writhing, frozen in his arms. It was a girl she saw, with shredded bark for breasts and dark charred wood for legs, as if the limbs had been snatched from a fire while burning. Her twig hands raked her captor's face. The young woman could read no emotion on it, however. The plank face had been scraped clean. All the fear and anger burned instead inside their twisting bodies. She could see the two there stuck at a point of perfect hatred for each other. She for his attack, he for her resistance. Perhaps the beauty he could not stand in her as her last date in college had hissed. You think you're so fucking pretty spitting it into her face so that she'd had to turn her cheek to wipe it, which was when he grabbed her arm then, pinning her. <clears throat> was this why her cousin had been chosen? To make what she'd had no words for? Persephone, the piece she stood amazed before, had been titled, the last unconscious gift of her grandmother. For your wedding, she'd said her last week, pointing to her own open palm in which nothing rested. Perhaps her grandmother had imagined a gold ring there, perhaps a string of thick pink pearls. The young woman drove home from the gallery, took a shower, and did not tell anyone that day what it was she'd seen. A month later in the mail, a package came from her father, her grandmother's Singer sewing machine, its antique brass wheels scrubbed of gold, the wooden handle glossy with vines of mother of pearl. It was lovely. And for a moment, she considered sewing a quilt with it, onto which she might embroider shooting stars and reds and saffron, the figure of a child, perhaps, or of a man by a house's courtyard, his hat in his hands, his broad body naked, harmless. How much thread would that take to make, she wondered, and considered it a long while before packing up the machine again sliding it back into its crate and high up onto a shelf of her basement closet, the place she kept her college books and papers where she told herself it could wait. Nightingale, a gloss. Nay, then I'll stop your mouth. Shakespeare, Titus Andronicus. Language is the first sight of loss and our first defense against it. Which is why, after Philomela's brother-in-law, Tyrius, rapes her, he cuts out her tongue and tosses it, the bloody stump writhing at her feet. In my poem, Philomela, I leave out this mutilation. Strike out Philomela's sister, Procne, who learns of her sister's rape from the tapestry Philomela weaves. 
cut the death of Italus, Procne's son, whom the sisters dismember and boil for punishment, Philomela mute but grinning, tossing the boy's head at his father. No metamorphosis of Philomela and Procne into Nightingale and Swallow, Tyrius shrunk into the hoopoe that, that pursues them. Such details would be unimaginable, I think. Not because a contemporary reader can't imagine them, but because the details are too garish to believe. Ovid makes the trio's transformation occur at the instant syntax shifts from the conditional to the imperfect. The girls went flying as if they were on wings. They were on wings, he writes. The difference between simile and metaphor. The second the mouth conceives it, the imagination turns it into the real. I'm writing Philomela at an artist's colony where I go for runs. Sometimes a man in a car will pace me. Sometimes a man on his bike circles back to get another look. Sometimes the men who pass me say nothing. Around this residency are woods in which the staff informs us we can walk. It is beautiful here, and there are olive groves. I do not ever walk by myself in the woods. It's 1992, and I'm hiking near Loch Ness. It's just after breakfast. I've spent the morning alone in a stand of aspen that circles the lake. When the three men find me, the smell of beer and whiskey thick on their clothes, bait boxes and fishing rods in hand, and I have just sat down with a book. The men, I, men are red-eyed, gruff. The first two nod as they pass me. It is the third who walks back. He has lank, gingery hair and black spots in his teeth. Hello, he says when he reaches me. Nightingale, Old English, Nicht Gala, Nicht Galen, small reddish brown migratory bird celebrated for its sweet night song during the breeding season. In Dutch, a frog. Virgil, the Georgics, Book Four. As morning beneath the poplar shade, the nightingale laments her lost brood. She sobs night long, and on a branch perched, her doleful song renews. Shelley, the defense of poesy. A poet is a nightingale who sits in darkness and sings to cheer its solitude with sweet sounds. His auditors are as men entranced by the melody of an unseen musician. Are you an American, he asks. I always wanted to kiss an American. Female nightingales do not sing. Only the male sings, as Tyrius does, attempting to woo Philomela with words. Love made him eloquent, Ovid writes, suggesting that Tyrius's language is aroused by Philomela's silence. What space is a woman? Some palace and place which furthered my invention, for I am in that point of Ovid his opinion that sicupia sponte desertus erit, desire makes a man spontaneously eloquent, a pleasure palace arising both, arousing both erotic and narrative desire. Just a kiss, he says, dropping his tackle box, and I know I should run. He grabs my head, and I am already clawing at his neck, terrified for myself, but also terrified of hurting him. Hurting him will make it worse for me. He hisses in my ear as I slap his hands, and now he's got his arms around me. I rear back, unbalancing myself, so that when I do the one thing I've been taught, which is to bring my right knee up hard into his groin, the blow is too weak. That didn't work, I stammer as my leg grazes the inside of his thigh. It never does, he replies. And now he has me on the ground. Philomel, Philomela, Middle English from Greek, Philomela's song, a nightingale, Matthew Arnold, to Philomela. How thick the bursts come crowding through the leaves. Again thou hearest, eternal passion, eternal pain. I do not use my voice. Two other men are ahead of us in the woods. I have no idea what they will do if called back, where their allegiances will lie. As if these were rules agreed upon, he doesn't shout either. In retrospect, his silence suggests that his friends might have taken my side, but at that moment, he seemed to see her stand apparently before him, only a strong imagination assuring him it was she, which sight sunk so deeply into his heart and brought him such excessive delight that he presently awakened and missing the party that procured him such pleasure, his joy was turned to annoy, writes George Petty in his rewriting of the myth. To see past what we know into what we desire, to put desire into language, and by performing that, 
to enact in the reader a similar performance. The art is not finished until we think the outcome for ourselves. My hands are pushed up against his chest. His hands are in my pants on my breasts. He says nothing, though he grimaces, his face close to my own as he leans to kiss me so that I whip my head away. I can feel the cold leaves against my cheek, the damp earth can spy my book lying a few feet off. Just let him, something small, dry, miserable in me says. Let him, and it will all be over. But I don't. I keep my mouth shut, and I fight. There is no scream after the tongue is cut, but we hear a cry. Philomela screams only in the text, thus in our minds, in that her body and our own do not communicate. We cannot hear it. We want to, but she exists only in our imagination, an absent body that exists in the past or the unforeseeable future. She begs for help we can never give. It is absurd to suggest we could. In that sense, she never needed a tongue to scream for help. She never had one. The rape isn't described in my poem, Philomela. It takes place off stage, recorded years after the event by the character who experienced it. I left out the rape, thinking to reject a reader's voyeurism. But the reader of myths knows what is left out. My silence is not a revision, but an invitation to imagine to remember this violence for yourself. Procne, too, must imagine her sister's violation. Philomela's weaving thus becomes a muslin veil drawn over experience, both bringing her sister in and shutting her out. There is another woman at the residency who runs, and when we meet over meals, we list our encounters with a well-rehearsed mixture of irony and exhaustion. We are scared, and we are not scared, both irrational positions based on our experience in the world. She is a black woman in a white nation. I am someone who's been attacked. We live our lives with the knowledge that further can always happen. The man pushing out of the hedge, tackle box swinging, the hard gleam of muscles along the cop's arm as he rides up suddenly into the light. Take the requisite precautions, but what use is more fear? We have to imagine less or stop running. And then his fingers are tearing inside me, his tongue filling my own mouth. The woods are ruthless, dreadful, deaf, and dull. There speak and strike, brave boys, and take your turns. There serve your lusts, shadowed from men, heaven's eye, and revel in Lavinia's treasury. Shakespeare, Titus Andronicus. He stops. He withdraws his hands from my pants, lets go of my hair. I curl my legs up into my chest as he pushes himself unsteadily off me. That wasn't much, was it? He asks. He brushes leaves from his clothes. When I try and explain what his teeth looked like, what his breath smelled like, the cold ridges of his nails as they clawed inside me, I know I am asking for something beyond the response of your own suffering, your awareness of my suffering. I don't care what you know or how you feel. I want to go back in time to an eternal before. I want you to give me what no one give, you know, give, give me, which is why, for years, I have resisted talking about it. Tongue, Old English, tongue and Latin, lingua, an organ of speech, a figure or representation of this organ, the faculty of speech, a voice, a vote, suffrage to assail with words, to cut a tongue, to slit or shape a tongue in a plant for grafting, giving great tongue, a cry made by hounds when they scent a fox. Will not my tongue be mute, Tarquin wonders at the thought of raping Lucretia. The rape must mark him as well, a blot upon his face as well as language, violence carving its sin upon his own self. If she cannot go unmarked, he cannot either, the body giving tongue to its distress. Shakespeare, the late rape of Lucretia. It is not rape, and yet. Sexual violence has been historically difficult to articulate. Chaucer devoted the fifth book of The Legend of Good Women in part to creating subcategories of words akin to rape, ra raving, a rape linked with abduction, robbery, a rape occurring in the woods, stealth, an attack cloaked in secrecy. We would not care to make such distinctions, but Chaucer's characters do. When Amans, Latin, loving, is asked whether or not he has committed the sin of raving, he denies it, admitting only to the possibility of stealth. It is important, he demands, to be specific. 
What happened to me feels like something that exists between words, a subcategory of expression for which there is no one easy expression. Raving, old French ravinaire plus Latin rapinare to pillage, sweep down to violently sweep away. Raving, middle French resver, to wander, to be deliver, delirious. Raving is applied to the vacantes or minads, whose name means raving ones. Procne first appears in Ovid's tale dressed as the Bacante's queen, in all the dress of frenzy, spear over her shoulder, draped in vines and deer hide. Philomela, voiceless suffering, is visited by her sister, Rage, a raping, a raving. Raving. At the heart of the story is madness, a word sonically, if not etymologically, attached to the word for rape. Raving is a contagion that spreads through imagination and desire. To the ancient writers, only raving breeds and explains female aggression. Agave, driven mad by Dionysus for her unbridled tongue, doesn't know her son Pentheus spikes his head on a stake. Medea, to punish an unfaithful Jason, dismembers their children. To wound one is to wound the other, bodies linked by sperm and milk and blood. Don't infect me with your madness. If art is the eloquence left Philomela, what answer does it inspire? Pain speaks to pain. Why should one make pretty speeches and the other be dumb, Procne wonders, looking back and forth between Philomela's tapestry and her son. <clears throat> Italus's ability to speak throws Philomela's silence into loud relief, and though he says nothing in the myth, his flesh keeps something of the spirit alive. When Procne dismembers him, he leaps in the boiling water, hisses on the skewers. Pain, too, is a language. It raves in me with a diabolic tongue. Rape is the dark seam of the metamorphoses. To Ovid, a poet, perhaps the ultimate dehumanizing act would bring the body to a place beyond language. People in his version of the myths often become animals, men and women more cut off from words than a seal, as Robert Lowell wrote of one man stint spent in the hospital. To live cut off from words is to descend into the bodily, the irrational. It is, if words make law and government, to be outside political power. To make his literate male audience understand such powerlessness, Ovid frames the rape from Philomela's point of view. He centers male agency within a silent female consciousness. But if you stubbornly keep lying down in bed dressed, you'll feel my hands by way of your torn dress. In fact, if my anger should carry me further, you'll show wounded arms to your mother. Or Ovid features rape because it is a trope of Roman elegiac discourse, arma, amor, ira. Either way, desire is scripted by violence. Madness to insist upon narrative cohesion when the story is one of fragmentation, chaos. The story is one of raving. Philomela's descent is an unveiling of the animal heart at the world's center, the girl running as if flying into the woods, the girl flying, Tyrius crystallized in the body of a spike-crowned predator. If we become the thing which symbolizes us, it is not change, but revelation. Tyrius was a passionate man, and all the Thracians are quick at loving. Two fires burned in him, his own passion and his nation's. To Ovid, violence is brute, natural, indifferent. It wells up and bends blood, a moral emptiness that obeys no rules because it understands none. In the Metamorphoses, the truth of violence is that it might erupt at any time. The void always threatens to yawn before us, and we struggle to assemble words that will explain it. Only language, which orders time and gives experience shape and meaning, controls how violence is experienced. It gives back agency. There was no time ever when she would rather have had the use of her tongue, the power to speak, to express her full rejoicing, Ovid writes, after Philomela throws Italus's bloody head at Tyrius's feet. Language is made to contain our awareness of, even our celebration in, suffering. The pain attending our pleasure. The pleasure we take in another's pain. Here are the words describing Philomela's cut tongue. Immurmurat murmurs, palpitat quivers, queret strives. Like a lover, the tongue murmurs, it quivers, it strives for its mistress. 
Positioning an implicitly male audience in the consciousness of a raving, raped woman tilts the myth from one of identification to one of rejection. To portray Philomela's calls for justice within the frame of madness reduces her moral justification for Tyrius's punishment. It focuses the reader's gaze back upon her mutilated body, her tortured mind, turning our guard from one of empathy to spectacle. Keats, in his copy of Titus Andronicus, a play that rewrites the myth of Philomela, struck out with his pen several of the taunting lines spoken by Demetrius and Chiron after they've raped Lavinia, sliced out her tongue, and cut off her hands. He drew his pen vigorously over their dialogue, mutilating speech, violence overriding violence. Marcus. Speak, gentle niece, what stern, ungentle hands have lopped and hewed and made thy body bare of her two branches, those sweet ornaments. In Julie Tamor's Titus, Lavinia wears branches for hands, recalling Shakespeare's recurring metaphor. Lavinia's hands tremble like aspen leaves upon a lute. Chiron, sneering, suggests her stumps will let her play the scribe. Wood, a scene of violation. Wood as body, body as failed writing instruments. Lavinia's changes, too, are metonymic. The girls run as if flying. They are flying. Branch. Middle English, also French, branche. A tree limb or stem, a child, also figurative. A division, to strike out on a new path, to divide. Hue. Old English, hewen, to strike forcefully, to cut, to shape, to slaughter. Limb. Old Teuton, limo. Organ or part of the body, limb, Latin limbus, an edge, or boundary of a surface. Near an olive grove by the residency lives a bird which mimics human song. An opera singer stands there certain afternoons, dust in the tall grasses, heat bringing out the scent of lemon and jasmine. She sings into the field where the unseen bird nests, a tree branch swaying under its small body. The bird waits a beat after she finishes, then matching her note for note, trills back. Try it yourself, she says, charmed by this idea of speaking across species. Perhaps a mating call, perhaps a delineation of territory. Keats returned often to the figure of the nightingale, a symbol common to the romantic poets. Ode to a nightingale, still wouldst thou sing, and I have fears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod, the eve of St. Agnes. But to her heart, her heart was voluble, painting with eloquence her balmy side, as though a tongueless nightingale should swell her throat in vain and die, heart stifled in her dell. La belle dame sans merci, and no bird sing. I am most interested in his Philomela reference in The Eve of St. Agnes. It is not only that his Madeline is like Philomela, voiceless while her body throbs with unspoken pain, but that Keats's Philomela, his nightingale, must die. And here you have to imagine a swath of Shakespeare packed out. Is the metonym finally for Philomela art or silence or raving? Later poets' use of the nightingale suggests she is a poet able to sing about and against suffering, but Ovid never mentions song. Instead, he symbolizes Philomela and Procne by the murder of Italus, and even so, the red marks of the murder stayed on their breasts. The feathers were blood-colored. What is our longing to hear Philomela's song but our own desire for retributive justice? Ovid's story is clear. The tongue which might give voice to reparation is mute beside the body's recounting of injury. Philomela's story, then, is meant to excite, to enrage. Perhaps the greatest desire a victim of violence has is to look in memory at that violence dispassionately. But remembering the heart pounds, the body floods with adrenaline ready to tear back off into flight. For some, there is no smoothing chaos into memory. Poetry, with its suggestion that time and pain can be ordered through language, strains to constrain suffering. It suggests, but rarely achieves, the redress we desire. Language does not heal terror. And if it brings us closer to imagining the sufferer's experience, this too does not necessarily make us feel greater compassion, but a desire for further sensation. If we cannot articulate pain beyond inspiring in the listener a need for revenge, we speak only of and to the body. 
Philomela's first communication of pain is visual. Like a film, her tortures scroll action by action across the tapestry. Like a film, these images manipulate our emotions. Philomela's pain cannot be relieved except through equivalent actions that heighten the need for, but never achieve, the catharsis denied the original sufferer. Perhaps this is the reason Ovid does not describe her song. She does not sing, because no song will soothe what she has suffered. Sufferance, Middle English, sufferance, and Latin, suffrar. Patient, endurance, the suffering of pain, trouble, damage, wrong, sanction, consent, or acquiescence. Suffer, to cause pain, also to endure pain. That the branches of poetry are silence and sufferance. In my poem, Philomela, the woman who has been raped, inherits, years after her attack, an antique sewing machine from her grandmother. She imagines using this machine to sew a quilt on which she will embroider figures of the domestic life her grandmother ruefully noted she did not have, a house, a child, a man. But after a few minutes' contemplation, she boxes up the machine, slides it high up on a bedroom shelf. <coughs> what is she communicating? Who would she be speaking to? She can always return to the quilt, she tells herself. But in the unwritten rest of the poem, I imagine for her, she never will. Not rape, I say, meaning certain body parts and not others were used, meaning I do not see that last ignominy to him, will never name how I lay in the dirt and ground my screams back down into me. But what is the word for what I experienced after? What is the word for how I awoke to fear and never went back to sleep? Time drives the flocks from field to fold, when rivers rage and rocks grow cold, and Philomel becometh dumb, the rest complains of cares to come. At some point, the nightingale falls silent. Time erases the song by numbing the wound, replacing it with fresh complaints, new hurts she can't yet fathom. I'd like to imagine the fact I fought was the reason the attack ended, but the truth is he let me go. If he'd wanted more, there was no question more would have happened. I would have stopped fighting and become what some might call an accomplice to the act. I was, in fact, already going limp, subtly acceding to his desires in the hopes that, having satisfied them, he would stop. Perhaps this is why he pushed himself away from me. Perhaps it was enough that he grabbed and inserted and taken what he could within narrow legal or personal limits to prove a point to me and to himself. Anything he wanted, he would have. In the end, I was not so much a body to be reckoned with, but a structure he could humiliate and dismantle. In life, time's passage allows us to see ourselves change, but a poem's chronology forces us to see repetition. Lyric time is not progressive, but fragmentary and recursive. Traumatic time works like lyric time, the now of terror repeatedly breaking through the crust of one's consciousness. Mourning the wound thus becomes an obsessive love for the lost. Mourning is merely the process by which you remain stuck, the bird always in flight, the hoopoe continually in pursuit. Oh, could our mourning ease thy misery. One fantasy in and outside of poetry is that time itself stops, but Raleigh's point is that time never stops. Instead, it's continual unfolding disorder me disorders memory. It blunts and numbs. Time is the subject that silences Philomela. Compassion and retributive justice require that we hold multiple senses of time alive in mind. The past events, a punishment's present, the future in which this crime cannot be no can no longer be enacted. Compassion calls for complex responses. Revengeance calls for only one, a raving. I don't have compassion for my attacker, just as I don't have a word for that day, only a description of its unfolding. Behind these descriptions, you may imagine the word or punishment you think appropriate. This act is done for yourself. It is not, though you may believe it is, at all useful to me. Lucky, I think, after he leaves, my shirt torn, nose running. Nothing stirs in the woods. Still I sit on the forest floor, unsure where to run. Will he come back? Will he be on the trail? Will I see him in town? At the thought of town, at the thought of being seen by him or any other human, I shake and burn with shame. 
I suspected Howard could sing more than one song. Nightingales engage in singing contests, their songs changing over time. The song is not generic, but individualized, dependent on the hour of day and also on the season. In poetry, the song may be one of suffering and loss. In nature, it is simply one of life. Does the bird sing or does it not sing? Is it a symbol for what threatens to overwhelm our senses or for what permanently transforms? The bird is death. No wonder Keats imagines himself dying when he hears it. No wonder he scratches out the speech of Lavinia's tormentors in his copy of Shakespeare. Silence will come for him as well as for her and for all of us. There is no shame in it. Death attends our longing for the song. Sing, for you are voiceless. Sing, for it cannot matter. Sing, for soon no one will hear you again. I have spent the better part of my life devoted to an art whose foundational symbol is one of unspeakable violence. Did I seek poetry out for this reason? Or was I, that day in the woods, made into a poet? Perhaps, whether we are changed into our opposites or shrunk down into the form that best defines us, some part of transformation is always a curse. I am what I always was. Perhaps it is sentimental to suggest violence has given me meaning, that the heart of poetry for me was never speech but silence. Madness to say, yes, there's pain, but what I have changed without it. If the song is beautiful, you will listen to it. In the field one day outside the residency, I encounter, or think I encounter, the bird that's charmed the opera singer. I am near a row of acacia trees when I hear its sudden, piercing trill of notes rise and fall. It could be any kind of bird, really, any kind of song. A cry of sex or terror, a mimicry of its parents, or an invention all its own. A flourish it will teach to its offspring, its own embellishments branching through the ancient notes. It is the sound of time. It is the sound of time passing. I stand in the field. I whistle back. I will end with a lighter poem, <laughs> which would be, would be hard not to find a lighter poem that. <laughs> no, sorry, let me take a drink of water. <laughs> There's a bar right here, so things are going to get really good in a minute. Um, this is a poem from <clears throat> my book, Imaginary Vessels, and the poet I reference is a wonderful poet you should all rush out and buy, Raul Zarita. Mortal love. If we were immortal, the poet said, like the Greek gods, love would not be needed because time ceases to matter. Love needs urgency to be felt at all, at which point I left the hall, hurrying home to cook his dinner and change the sheets, to sit a moment and rest before you came back home to me, thinking all the time of the gods in our stories who, even with eternity to spare, loved, which brought them into the human realms of war and murder, the chaining of lesser beings in pits of flame, the skinning of rivals, and the creation of children, sometimes beautiful, sometimes monstrous. The need for the shapes and skins of animals to disguise their desires, meaning the gods knew guilt, too, and shame, and jealousy. They knew, as we tell ourselves, about all the human emotions in which love is rooted. Self-love and love for spouses, daughters, sons, other people's wives. The love for ex-lovers, too, those secret old needs flamed out but the ashes nursed out of respect for the failure. The gods loved because we wanted them to be like us. No, it is not an excess of time that would keep them from feeling it. Love embroiders time, moving in and out of what we could imagine of it, or what, if we were gods, we would finally know. For them, death is the thing that is expendable, never match it. And it is because of all the things they loved, eternity would teach them to covet most their power and their will. We have these things too, in abundance, but not time. For love needs no time at all. Thank you. So I was told that I, can do, I should do a Q&A. Any questions? Yes. If 
sorry, I know that you don't like my Oh, no, you. not you. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you mentioned to our class that one of your mentors said you should never start with the last line of a poem because it will kill your poem. And I, my question to you is maybe you don't start with the end or you don't know where you're going to end up. But do you start with an intention for your poem that you sustain throughout the writing process, or does that change for you as well? I really, I only start with a question. So I, I don't, I really just don't know. I honestly don't know. <laughs> what a great answer. Um, <laughs> any other questions? <laughs> Two seconds more, and then I'm just drifting off to the bar. <laughs> Ask now. Yes. So I, I wonder if you could speak about your relationship between poetry and nonfiction, and how those work together you know, in your process. Okay. So, um, I mean, they're really wildly different parts of the brain. Um, and you, you write prose, you know how that has to work. I mean, I, I think. The thing about nonfiction is that it forces me to think about things that poetry. I get to uh, th these would be my weak points, you know, time <laughs> actually, um, getting people in and out of rooms, character, dialogue, and things like that. And so, um, nonfiction forces me to actually reckon with um, a linear process of thinking. Um, you know, the piece I read, Nightingale, a gloss, obviously moves between nonfiction and poetry. It, it utilizes what I consider both my kind of strengths in that way. Um, but generally speaking, uh, every book of poetry comes with a sort of twin book in nonfiction. That if I can't answer it in poetry, I will turn to nonfiction as a way of exploring something else in the hopes that I can answer it. So Animal Eye came along with Intimate, which is all about photographic looking, Imaginary Vessels, which is about historical, like, creating vessels to contain and imagine history came along with the broken country, which is all about the ways in which we continue to think about, you know, the legacy of the Vietnam War. And my, you know, my research into trauma and trauma theory and PTSD obviously informed a lot of the ways that I was able to engage with Nightingale. So they kind of leapfrog, like one interest actually triggers um, a movement in the other genre and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it's, if you look at my career, in some ways it's like a ladder of thinking. Um, so I, you know, I love nonfiction because it also, with poetry I feel like I'm just, you know, struggling sometimes and I write myself into corners and then I have to take a break and I can move into nonfiction and it gives me this opportunity to move forward. So I'm writing, I'm not writing poetry right now at all really, I'm writing critical essays on um, poems about war and how we represent war in poetry and violence in poetry. So I'm taking a little break from that. Um, but it is interesting also to work in two genres where I feel like I'm fairly successful in poetry and I feel like a wild failure in nonfiction. Um, and and so, it, I mean, that's kind of funny too. And I think part of it is because I never was trained, you know, if you went to Michigan, we know, they never gave us a nonfiction class. Maybe they added that, I don't know if they did. But um, like you were stuck in your genre, like, you know, circles of hell you like had you know <laughs> never get out of poetry and so um everything i've learned about nonfiction, i literally had to teach myself and of course nonfiction is this just blurry term that encompasses everything from science writing to cultural criticism to radio essays to you know philosophy and each one demands a different sort of genre constraint and so that's the other thing i also love about nonfiction is that it just offers up so many different forms to write and think in last question <laughs> yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. um, wow, thanks for sharing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's always what they say when they want you to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you for sharing. sharing. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it, like, yeah. sharing such personal uh, and powerful work. Um, and I wonder, kind of, walking the lines between um, making uh, Something along like liter uh, like making a point on literary works, kind of the walking the line between scholarship and personal experience. Mm -hmm. um, what like what drove you to write that first poem you uh, you read? Was it uh, an interest in uh, interrogating uh, your own personal experience through literature, or an interest to use your own 
from my experience of how you could demonstrate if that makes sense. Or it does make sense. I mean, the question is, you know, a lot of scholars would be um, horrified to do this kind of work, right? Because they would be like, there's no room for the personal to do it. And actually, I think, you know, like the, the poet nonfiction writer Maggie Nelson would make the exact opposite argument that, in fact, you know, there, there's a real strength to, to putting critical theory <laughs> into the realm of the personal because it's not as if we just go to texts and experience this. This informs our life. Um, and, you know, I, I doubt a, a critical journal would ever have taken Nightingale a gloss um, seriously, but I do see it as a fairly serious investigation of the symbol of the Nightingale um, in literature and to think about these other kinds of ways. Um, but I never even thought to go to, you know, modern philology or whatever it is, you know, to, to, um, to publish that. But I do think that there is a value, I think as writers, there is a value to bringing all of yourselves together. Um, so we are often reading in critical theory. We're often reading, you know, in wildly different disciplines. And why aren't we using that? Why aren't we bringing that into our own writing? Because it seems to me that the personal is only um, added to when we see it in hi having historical meaning um, and and a kind of critical weight that extends beyond the self into something that we could say this is a this is a cultural. Um, this is a long-standing cultural argument and discussion to be had. Um, and also, I said in, in Bruce's class earlier, like one of the questions I always ask myself as a writer is just like, when I think I might be boring the reader, I have to ask myself, like, why am I interested in it? Why is this bothering me? Why am I, why am I, you know, at some point I had to sit down and say, why am I writing about Ovid's The Metamorphoses? And, you know, it's one thing to sort of playfully redo the story of Daphne or Persephone or Philomela, but at some point you have to say, what do these stories have in common? Um, and they all have, you know, a very strong, rapey quality to them, <laughs> to put it, you know, in, you know, high lit crit terms. You know, it's a real, it's a rapey ass poem, you know? And, and so when we, when you think about that, you're like, well, wait, is that why I'm attracted to it? You have to, you have to investigate that. And I think that, you know, it's an honesty that can only be rewarded, I think, because the reader wants to know, the reader wants to know why you're doing this, too. Um, I don't think it, it helps. I mean, I think you can be very narrative, you can be very clear in your writing and still be very complex. Um, it's not, it's not, I don't want to be obscure in any of the kinds of ways. I don't think that helps anybody. So I, I think the personal really helps to kind of prevent that kind of obscurity of thinking. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, so uh, the Outgate program, we're in our workshop classes approaching the revision period. And mm -hmm. I was wondering, kind of, how do you start your revision process? What kind of what kind of advice do you have in terms of you know writers who may not have experienced such an intensive revision process before? You know, I I, I was saying before in, in Bruce's class that my, revision is my favorite thing because writing sucks. Writing <laughs> <laughs> writing writing cold is so hard, you know, because um, and I think for maybe this is just about me too, because I feel like as I get older, it's harder and harder to get into an unconscious space where I don't know where I'm going. Because you start to know what a, you know, I start to know what a Paisley Rectal poem is going to sound like and what it's going to do. And so I have to try to not do what I've done before. So I often set myself very particular formal challenges to, to, to get away from that. And so um, revision is for me, just a blessing. I, I have no problems with it because I can revise a poem endlessly because the material is already there and I get to actually play with the idea of different um, avenues of thought. I mean, I always tell my students that uh, we, we tend to approach workshops as if there's this platonic ideal poem that's just waiting for you, but it's, it's not that way. You can make a thousand different poems out of a poem. Every choice you make is merely a choice. And to make that choice and to see where it takes you, you know, keep your original. You know, so you're like, no, no, not that one. <laughs> let's, let's try that and choose your own adventure kind of thing. But, you know, I do find that that becomes um, a very useful um, kind of exercise. And it, it, it gets me into that place where I can disappear into the writing more than just writing itself. Oh, yes. So as far as revision, how do you know when to stop? Like, I, I was writing a poem one day, and I kept revising and revising, I got really obsessed with it, and then I just said at some point I have to, you have have to stop. stop, because I don't know whether it's going to be overworked, mm -hmm. maybe the first one was more spontaneous, mm -hmm. or whether it's getting better. Yeah, that's a good question, and I don't really know the answer, um, because largely, um, largely at some point I feel like, I mean, I, I feel like I'm just going to repeat what a lot of writers have said, which is, you know, 
eventually you just accept the failure and move on, right? You know, you're like, that's as good as it's going to get. I'm just going to move on. And and, um, and you do want that spontaneity. You do want that sense of freshness. And I think to a certain extent, I, I what I also do is I build in days when I'm not writing or reading, or not writing or editing at all. I usually build in a two-day you know, period where I don't look at anything like that. And that's where nonfiction helps because I'll often revise something a lot and then I'll stop and I'll move to another genre and then I'll come back and then it's like with fresh eyes. So the one thing I would say is don't revise it every day. Um, that's where you will stop. You'll stop seeing it. Um, but, you know, when you wait a period of time and come back to a poem and read it, oftentimes you'll see, oh man, that's dead. That's just, I just killed that. It's really dead. Um, and I think that Carl Phillips once said, and he said it's truth, and someone asked him, why are you so prolific? He said, I just got better at de determining when a poem was useless to work on. And um, I think that, you know, the more I write, the more I realize that might be true for myself too. Like I can see what might be truly just dead and, and, and realize I'm not gonna spend too much time editing it. Um, but I don't think that answers your question at all. So, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, thank you guys so much. <laughs>